It is November 1939, and Europe is consumed by war. Poland has fallen to the invading armies of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. As the first snows begin to fall in the continent's northeast, a sparsely populated, newly independent country stands isolated, at risk of being crushed in the titanic struggle. Caught in a deadly strategic dilemma, Finland faces invasion by the USSR. The Baltic nation of just four million people can never hope to defeat the Soviet juggernaut. Yet, when the Winter War begins on November 30th, the world watches in awe as the Finnish military halts and severely bloodies the invading Soviet armies in a heroic act of resistance. To understand how this extraordinary feat of arms was possible, we will explore the equipment, the organization, and the tactics of the Finnish army on the eve of World War II. If you like stories of dogged resistance, are fascinated by the interwar period, and love the RTS genre, then I can highly recommend today's sponsor, Last Train Home. The game was inspired by the historical tale of the Czechoslovakian Legion which found itself caught in the brutal civil war between Russia's Red and White armies following World War I. Now, you must lead the men aboard an armored train to survive the gauntlet of chaos which leads the way home. At a high level, the strategic gameplay sees you negotiate dilemmas and gather resources along your route. Materials can then be invested in maintaining and upgrading your train to ensure that you don't break down. Meanwhile, supplies help keep the soldiers fed, healed, and happy. But it's not enough just to survive. Proper management of the crew is key for all the non-combat roles aboard the train, as well as the real-time missions which will see you deploy armed squads to achieve victory over those who stand in your way. As a fan of this genre and time period, I've really enjoyed Last Train Home. The team has done an amazing job crafting a refreshing game with great mechanics and even better character-centric, focused narrative. What's even better is that their just-released DLC, Legion Tales, introduces a whole new collection of self-contained missions. Each one offers an electrifying experience, as recalled by the veteran Zoltan. There's many paths to victory, with lots of replayable challenges to sink your teeth into. So check it out now and support the channel by clicking the link in the description below. Enjoy! Let's take a step back and briefly examine the emergence of the state of Finland and its armed forces to better understand how these two countries came to the precipice of war. We can begin by rewinding the clock to the 19th century. For many years, the territories of modern Finland were ruled by Sweden, and Finnish soldiers distinguished themselves in numerous wars in service of the Swedish crown, frequently against the Russian Empire. After Russia's victory over Sweden in the Finnish War in 1809, Finland was annexed to the Tsar's empire as an autonomous Grand Duchy. Russian rule over Finland was marked by alternating waves of relative cultural autonomy and repressive Russification, subject to the whims and worries of the Tsars and their advisors. By the turn of the 20th century, growing fears of Finnish nationalism spurred the government of Tsar Nicholas II to begin a brutal program of repression against Finnish language and culture. Concerned that an autonomous Finland commanding its own military might seek independence and frustrated by Finnish draft dodging, the so-called oppression years saw the disbanding of the Finnish military and the replacement of the draft in Finland with additional taxation. This Russification policy, hampered by Finnish resistance and interrupted by the outbreak of World War I, contributed greatly to seething resentment and organized opposition against Russian rule. While some Finns, such as the future Finnish commander-in-chief Carl Gustav Mannerheim, saw service in the Imperial Russian Army during World War I, Finnish citizens were not subject to conscription and Finland played little part in the conflict. Nevertheless, the events of 1914 to 1917 set the stage for Finnish independence and for the bloody ideological struggles which followed it. Anti-Russian sentiment 
decades in the making, saw the rise in 1915 of the Jaeger movement, a German-led clandestine program to build the foundations of a new sovereign Finnish army, which saw 1,000 to 2,000 Finnish men secretly travel to Germany. Drawn primarily from the upper classes and driven by nationalist ideals, these men received extensive military training in the Kaiser's army and were organized and deployed as the elite 27th Jaeger Battalion. The Jaegers saw action against the Imperial Russian Army on the Eastern Front in 1917 in the Baltic. Upon their return to Finland, the Jaegers' training and leadership proved decisive in the Finnish Civil War, and Jaeger veterans went on to form the foundation of the post-war Finnish military. In the wake of the collapse of the Russian Empire and the societal upheaval of the February and October revolutions of 1917, Finland seized the opportunity to break away from Russian dominion. The Finnish Senate ratified the fledgling state's constitution on December 6, 1917, and secured recognition of independence from Lenin's Bolshevik government, who was stretched too thin to suppress a Finnish rebellion. But war was to come to Finland soon enough. The climate of revolution and tensions between Finnish Communist Red Guards and anti-communist White Guard forces quickly exploded into violence. Finland became embroiled in a brutal civil war between January and May 1918. Following the breakdown of governmental control throughout 1917, opposing paramilitary groups became the dominant forces in the cities and towns of Finland. Finnish Red Forces controlled the south of Finland, backed by the country's large working-class urban population and supported with men and weapons by Lenin's Bolsheviks. White conservative forces controlled the country's northern towns and estates, and were supported by Finland's wealthy industrialists and landowners, as well as the German Empire. Critically, the Finnish White Army could count on the support of returning Jaeger forces, whose leadership and tactical acumen proved decisive time and time again in a war fought largely by untrained militias. Equally important was the leadership of Mannerheim, who led the Whites as commander-in-chief, securing victory for Finnish anti-communist forces during the daring offensive actions of March and April 1918. The three-month war saw the deaths of more than 35,000 Finns and widespread use of terror tactics by all combatants, including the perpetration of war crimes against prisoners and civilians. The victorious white forces summarily executed thousands of red prisoners of war under orders from Mannerheim and allowed many thousands more to die in brutal conditions in post-war prison camps. Finland was left scarred by the civil war, but the country's imperiled government and democratic system slowly stabilized throughout the interwar period. A series of border conflicts in East Karelia and poor relations with the Soviet Union fed Finnish fears of invasion throughout this period. Finnish strategists, including veterans of the Jaeger movement and the Civil War, established the foundations for a well-trained infantry army. This effort was supported by a paramilitary organization called the Suojeluskunta, the Civil Guard. Directly descended from the Civil War White Guard, they contributed greatly to Finland's wartime preparedness while also playing a controversial role in post-Civil War political tensions. Their partner women's organization, the Lotus Verd, provided enormous additional support in a wide range of auxiliary roles. Military preparations were constrained by severely limited funds, a point of constant and fierce tension between military planners and the civilian government. The result was a well-trained fighting force highly motivated and underpinned by a sound doctrine, but desperately short of the heavy weapons and ammunition required. 
Finnish interbellum planning always assumed that the most likely war was won against the Soviet Union, a mammoth foe for a small and poor nation with a vast border to defend. The Defence Council, chaired by Mannerheim, recognised that utilising the rugged geography of the country would be key to survival in the event of war. A two-fold strategy was developed. The obvious routes for a Soviet invasion lay in the south of Finland, where the border with the USSR cut across the Karelian Isthmus, just 30 kilometres from the outskirts of Leningrad. The short distance between the border and Finland's second largest city of Vipuri necessitated a stiff defensive doctrine, designed to blunt and then contain an invading army on the Isthmus. If the Isthmus were to fall, the invader would be able to unstoppably fan out across the country. Here it was necessary to prepare strong fortifications. A defensive line which would eventually become known as the Mannerheim Line. Consisting of an extensive network of bunkers, dugouts, tank traps, minefields and trenches, and anchored on both flanks by old but powerful coastal guns. These defences were formidable. However, they were chronically underfunded like the rest of the Finnish military and were incomplete when war broke out in 1939. Finnish doctrine along the vast border north of Lake Ladoga was dictated by entirely different conditions. The front line in war would be a vast wilderness covered in trees and dotted with lakes with very few roads and only scattered villages for shelter. Here, Mannerheim outlined a strategy of defence in depth, where outnumbered Finnish defenders would trade land for time, allowing the Soviets to advance into the interior and overextend their supply lines in the unforgiving tiger forests. Shadowed and harassed every step of the way by Finnish soldiers and militias with intimate knowledge of the local terrain. Years of attempts by Finnish diplomats throughout the 1930s failed to form a security alliance with their Scandinavian neighbours, and as war loomed in Europe, the country was dangerously isolated. Although Finland and the USSR had signed a non-aggression pact in 1932, Stalin openly decried the threat which Finland posed to Soviet security, fearing that Finland would align with Germany and act as a springboard for a Nazi invasion. Secretly considering a preemptive invasion of Finland, Stalin dispatched diplomats in 1938 to demand assurances that Finland would repel any German attempt to move soldiers into the country and accept a Soviet intervention in the event of a German invasion. The Finnish government reaffirmed its neutrality and said it would repel any foreign invasion attempt, but gave no further allowances. The signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in August 1939 and the subsequent Nazi invasion of Poland dramatically worsened Finland's diplomatic isolation and emboldened Soviet demands. Armed with the secret assurance from Hitler that Finland lay in the Soviet sphere of influence, Stalin began pressing for territorial concessions in October 1939. Summoning a Finnish delegation to Moscow on October 5th, the Soviets demanded the surrender of the Karelian Isthmus and strategically important islands for control of the Baltic coastline. In exchange, the USSR would cede large tracts of eastern Karelia to the Finns. These demands placed Finland in an impossible position. The very land that Stalin demanded to ensure the security of Leningrad was the same terrain that gave Finland any hope of defending against a Soviet invasion, and their surrender would leave Finland defenseless. Fatefully, the Finns rejected the Soviet demands, offering lesser concessions that the Soviets in turn deemed unacceptable. With talks at an impasse, the Finnish delegation returned home on November 13th, expecting further rounds of diplomacy. Instead, following a false flag shelling of their own border outpost at Mainila on November 26th, the Soviet Union 
renounced their non-aggression pact with Finland and, on November 30th, issued a declaration of war. Now that we understand what brought the Soviet Union to invade Finland in the winter of 1939, we can explore the preparations and capabilities of the Finnish armed forces. We will start with an overview of the equipment of the Finnish military, before expanding to describe their organization, tactics and operational disposition during the Winter War. In terms of equipment, the average Finnish soldier had poor access to modern military gear, but was at least familiar with the harsh winters of their homeland. In many cases, reservists could not even be issued with winter pattern uniforms, being provided little more than a rifle when mobilized. Most soldiers had access to warm winter clothing and white smocks for snow camouflage, though the former were usually brought from home and the latter homemade by families or the lotter spared from bedsheets. Finnish soldiers overwhelmingly also had to self-supply gloves, warm socks, underwear and warm headgear. Helmets were worn rarely, if at all, being both in short supply and too cold to wear in frigid conditions. Skis were crucial equipment for every Finnish soldier, though some units faced shortages, particularly during the early days of the war. Finnish reservist and military training heavily emphasized proficiency with skis, and they were ubiquitous in civilian life meaning Finnish troops in winter were able to quickly and covertly cover large distances. This provided them with an advantage in mobility over their Soviet foes, and was central to several key victories. The primary weapon of the Finnish soldier was the sturdy mosin nagant bolt-action rifle, which had been the mainstay of warfare in the region since the turn of the century. Though there was modest production and refinement of the model during the interwar years, most Mosins in Finnish service were the classic M1891 model, many of which were decades old by the time of their use in the Winter War, as the Mosin was also the standard infantry weapon of invading Soviet forces, Finnish troops were readily able to use captured weapons and ammunition. Although limited in availability, Finnish soldiers could count on the effective support of a range of submachine guns, the most numerous of which was the KP-31 Suomi SMG. While only 4,000 KP-31s were available to Finnish forces during the Winter War due to their high production cost, this extremely reliable and rugged weapon proved so influential that it would have a lasting influence on infantry warfighting doctrine. First designed from 1930 by famous Finnish arms designer Aimo Lati, by 1939 the KP-31 was refined into a cutting-edge weapon of war. Usually armed with a 70-round drum magazine and spare barrels which could be easily replaced in the event of overheating from sustained fire, this weapon soon garnered a fierce reputation among invading Soviet troops for its devastating firepower. Beyond this, the Finns suffered from serious shortages of heavy machine guns, mortars and artillery pieces. The primary MG employed by Finnish forces was the trusty water-cooled Maxim. Many models of Maxim were in service during the Winter War, both of Finnish, Russian and imported designs, totaling several hundred guns. A respectable number for a small military, but far more sparsely available than in the Red Army. Notably, domestic Finnish weapons manufacturers, led once again by Amo Lati, made numerous modifications to their MGs, which greatly improved their performance and mobility in winter. These included ski mounts and modifications to the weapon's water jacket so that snow could be used to cool the gun. As a result, the Finns could count on far greater reliability from their MGs during the Winter War than their Soviet opponents, whose guns were plagued by problems with frozen coolant and lubricant. Artillery, mortar, anti-tank and anti-air support was limited and eclectic, acquired over the years from various sources. 
This caused severe logistical consequences for ammunition and spare parts as the war progressed. The most pressing shortages were in anti-tank weaponry, leaving Finnish soldiers ill-equipped to fight the thousands of tanks employed by the invading Red Army. The scattershot collection of around 100 anti-tank guns at the outbreak of war were spread far too thin to reliably counter Soviet armor. The Finns were therefore forced to rely upon mines, satchel charges, rugged terrain, and the soon-to-be infamous Molotov cocktail to destroy enemy armor. To this end, the Finnish home front produced 500,000 of these impromptu anti-tank weapons, and they were employed with surprising efficacy, but with corresponding heavy casualties due to the need to close with enemy tanks. Thus we have seen how Finland and Russia were set to collide in the Winter War, and how the defending soldiers, while outnumbered and outgunned, had the critical advantage of mobility and adaptability in the harsh conditions of their home turf. In our next episode, we shall see how these ragtag defenders were cobbled into an army to confront the Russians and what training and tactics they leveraged to withstand the Red Army onslaught. We shall then finally provide an overview of their service history with key examples of their deadly battlefield performance. The Winter War of 1939 between Finland and Soviet Russia was the culmination of a long history of tensions between the two nations. While a detailed review of the conflict is certainly warranted, in this series we will be looking specifically at the nature of the Finnish army as it prepared to face the Soviet juggernaut. In episode one, we delved into the evolution of the Finnish army in the lead up to the conflict, including a high level review of their strategic military philosophy, as well as a ground level view of the soldiers who were to carry out these plans. In this episode, we shall now see how the two came together with regards to the organization, training and tactics necessary to stop the Red Army. This is how the Finnish army fought the Winter War. In the lead up to the Winter War of 1939, the Finns had been preparing for a looming conflict with their Russian neighbors. While such tensions had existed for many generations, during the 20th century, Organized military opposition had begun during the years of the First World War, when several thousand young Finns were trained into the elite 27th Jäger Battalion by the German government. Such forces would return home to support the 1917 independence movement and eventually helped defeat the Red Faction in the ensuing civil war. During the interbellum period, these Jaegers would be among the veterans who helped staff the nascent ranks of the Finnish military, and who now sought to prepare their fledgling nation for its next existential crisis, a war with Russia. In our prior episode, we covered the two-front defensive strategy of the war planners, which focused on holding hardened positions along the Karelian Isthmus whilst adopting a defense in depth across Eastern Karelia. Now, let us take a closer look at how Finnish troops were organized to man these various positions. At this point, it will be important to note that a detailed analysis of this subject will be outside the scope of this video. Instead, we will be focusing our attention on the most relevant subject of how typical infantrymen were mobilized for combat in this period. Let us begin. One major point to make is that during the Winter War, Finnish formations were usually organized by geographic region, meaning that soldiers in a unit often knew their NCOs and officers personally. This contributed greatly to Finnish morale and coordination and inspired numerous acts of heroism. Unfortunately, it could have devastating consequences for morale within a unit as well as its community on the home front as heavy losses might mean the deaths of many men from a single town or village. 
Under this model, a typical reservist would be organized into a 10-man section led by an NCO. Most soldiers were armed with their own bolt-action rifle, with one man in each section being issued a submachine gun, usually the KP-31. Given severe material shortages, this was not always a guarantee, and so Finnish troops also availed themselves of every opportunity to supplement their firepower with captured Soviet weaponry. Ideally, every soldier in the section was also equipped with skis and could be relied on to be proficient in their use. Each Finnish rifle platoon contained two such sections. In addition, it employed two six-man LMG sections. Note five riflemen and one LMG. The Finns employed various domestic and imported LMGs, but also captured roughly 3,000 Soviet Degturev DPs during the Winter War, which quickly proved more reliable and popular than most of their own models. These sections were organized under a platoon HQ team, which consisted of an officer armed with a pistol or SMG, a sergeant, and two messengers for running orders and information. A Finnish rifle company consisted of four platoons. Its HQ team would consist of an officer, generally a captain, supported by a five-man battle messenger team for running orders. In addition, each company had a dedicated observer section for relaying and coordinating support weapon and artillery fire and a small detail specializing in defending against gas warfare, which remained a lingering threat from the Great War. Moving to a larger scale, here we see a Finnish infantry battalion around the time of the Winter War. It is important to keep in mind the ad hoc nature of the Finnish arsenal and severe shortages of equipment, as in reality, it is unlikely that many Finnish formations conformed perfectly to this model. Finnish field support weapons, namely heavy machine guns and mortars, were organized into companies controlled by the battalion HQ, though shortages of mortars in particular meant that many Finnish mortar companies were under-equipped. Their efforts were also hampered by a severe shortage of radios, which were rarely available at the battalion level. Battalions were thus forced to rely heavily on vulnerable phone lines and messenger runners who faced daunting challenges, particularly in the dark and confusing terrain of the eastern forests. Each battalion was supported by a large supply company. These men played a critical role in not just keeping troops supplied with ammunition, but also warm and well-fed in the blistering cold conditions of the Finnish wilderness. In dire conditions, these supply troopers could be called upon to fight with frontline forces and frequently performed commendably in combat. A Finnish rifle regiment held the main command elements of its constituent forces, centered around a 12-man command team. The regiment was responsible for the large-scale coordination and supply of its battalions, a task handled by a roughly 200-strong supply team. Most Finnish forces were supplied with radios at the regimental level, operated by a roughly 50-man signals platoon, though their reliability and numbers varied greatly. Each regiment also had a dedicated attached engineering force who were heavily involved in the planning and construction of field fortifications, as well as preparing roadblocks and traps to waylay Soviet armor. In addition, the regiment was responsible for the management of field kitchens. Their importance should not be underestimated as the availability of high-quality, hot food to Finnish troops made an enormous difference for their health and morale in the gruelling conditions of the war. In contrast, their Soviet foes too often endured frozen rations, with oil-fed cooking equipment that regularly froze solid in the minus 40-degree temperatures of the deep winter. 
An in-depth description of organization at the divisional level is beyond the scope of this video, but you're welcome to pause now to review the structure of a Finnish rifle division. We hope to explore the high-level command and control of the Finnish army in the future, but for now, let's move on to examining the training and tactics that underpinned the success of this fighting force. The tactics of the wartime Finnish army were dominated by a doctrine of mobile light infantry, focused on small unit tactics and emphasizing quick innovation and initiative at the NCO and section leader level. This approach arose both out of budgetary necessity and as a response to the highly asymmetrical nature of the war against Russia. With this in mind, training focused on the importance of marksmanship, mobility and the use of terrain to constrain a numerically superior foe. Soldiers, reservists and civil guard members extensively practiced ski-borne maneuver warfare disguising snow tracks and campfire smoke, creating ambushes and roadblocks and flanking and hit-and-run attacks. Many Finnish soldiers were also experienced in orienteering and navigating in the wilderness, particularly important in the depths of winter when snow has covered most landmarks. The sum of these skills and tactics combined with operational maneuver would prove critical in securing victory over Soviet forces in several key battles. The Finns were able to achieve this high level of preparedness with the assistance of several organizations, particularly the Army Reserve and the paramilitary Civil Guard. Finland's peacetime army stood at only 33,000 full-time soldiers, and so, the vast bulk of the 300,000 to 400,000 soldiers in Finland's wartime order of battle were reservists trained by one or both of these organizations, generally to a far superior standard than enjoyed by the conscripts in the opposing Red Army. A policy of universal conscription with regular refresher training maintained this baseline competency in Finnish ranks. Finnish troops were familiar with their NCOs and generally enjoyed a high level of unit morale and cohesion. Finally, the decision of the government to mobilize the military in October 1939 under the pretext of extraordinary autumn maneuvers ensured that Finnish conscripts were recently refreshed and gave them crucial knowledge of the terrain in which they'd be fighting just weeks later. It is worth keeping in mind that although the Finnish army was well-trained and motivated by the standards of the time, it consisted nonetheless mostly of mobilized conscripts with varying levels of training. Finnish troops often struggled to coordinate, particularly early in the war and particularly when fighting on the offensive. They also almost universally struggled against Soviet armor, against which they had minimal training and very few effective weapons. Indeed, there were numerous incidents of Finnish troops fleeing in terror in their first encounters with the Red Army's tanks. Nonetheless, the Finns employed what anti-tank guns they had to great effect and developed several innovative tactics for destroying and disabling armor, such as detonating charges under the ice of frozen lakes and streams as tanks were crossing them a tactic which soon made the Red Army fearful of deploying over the open ice. To put all this into action, we can now turn to the service history of these Finnish soldiers. However, again, it will be important to note that a comprehensive study of the Winter War will have to be covered in another series. For now, we will provide an overview of this conflict with highlights of key battles which demonstrate the capabilities of the Finnish Army. Here we see the map of the front line at the start of the war, which we can roughly divide into four theatres. The Karelian Isthmus Front, the Ladoga Karelia Front, the Central Finland Front, and the Arctic Front. When the Red Army begins its invasion on November 30th, 1939, it attacks along all four fronts. Its forces are split into 21 infantry divisions in four armies, 
supported by multiple armored brigades, a fighting strength of roughly half a million men, supported by 5,700 field guns, more than 6,500 tanks, and nearly 4,000 aircraft. Against them stand roughly 280,000 Finns mobilized across all branches of the armed forces, supported by about 400 artillery pieces, 32 obsolete tanks, and 75 combat aircraft. The Finnish army fields nine divisions and a number of smaller forces grouped into three corps. The primary Soviet thrust comes through the Karelian Isthmus, where the 120,000-strong 7th Army drives straight for Vipuri. The Finns anticipate this move and fight a successful week-long delaying action from the border to the prepared defences of the Mannerheim Line, which is reached on December 6. The Red Army forces, though outnumbering their opponents several times over, are ill-prepared and disorganised. Over the next fortnight, they launched numerous frontal assaults, aiming to breach the line through sheer weight of numbers. Despite appalling losses, they almost succeed, particularly in the Taipoli sector, where they manage to take parts of the main line before being repulsed by desperate Finnish counterattacks. By Christmas, the Seventh Army has exhausted itself against the Mannerheim line, and the newly reorganized Soviet command calls a halt to offensive operations as it begins a massive build-up for a renewed offensive. Meanwhile, north of Lake Ladoga, 12 Red Army divisions invade Finland across three axes. The Finns, considering the wilderness too unforgiving for large-scale operations, have greatly underestimated the size of the forces assaulting along the frontier. In Ladoga, Karelia, the Soviet 8th Army and its six divisions push westward with the goal of outflanking the Finns on the Mannerheim Line and see early success before they are halted by determined resistance at the battles of the Kula River and Talavervi. Severe winter conditions and congested logistics along the few usable roads in the region see the 8th Army grind to a halt with heavy losses, though their fate is kinder than that of the 9th Army to their north, which we shall now cover in greater detail. With the goal of bisecting Finland and driving for Oulu on the Baltic coast, the 9th invades with three divisions. Moving through the depths of the Finnish wilderness, its forces are constrained almost entirely to the unpaved Rata Road. The Finnish general staff is shocked by the rash decision to invade in such force, and with good reason. Even without Finnish resistance, the brutal winter conditions and total lack of infrastructure make sustaining the 9th impossible. The advance soon slows to a crawl, and thousands of troops are rendered frostbite casualties before even making contact with the enemy. With limited winter gear or survival training, and encumbered by massive numbers of tanks and guns, the 9th Army becomes practically immobile and extremely vulnerable to flanking attacks. The Finns urgently dispatch a flying column to the lightly defended region, dubbed Task Force Silasvua, after its commander, Yalmar Silasvua. The Soviet 163rd Division takes control of the village of Suo Mulsalmi on December 7th. Though it provides little shelter, as it has been burnt by retreating Finns the night before. Rapidly reinforced by the arriving task force, the Finns repulsed the 163rd's attempts to push further west from Suo Mulsalmi, inflicting heavy losses. Next, using their superior mobility and equipped with sleds and skis, the Finns set about encircling the 163rd and isolating it from the nearby 44th Rifle Division. This is achieved primarily by establishing well-sited roadblocks at a choke point between lakes on the Rate Road. The Finns specifically target Soviet ski patrols and launch deadly hit-and-run attacks using small submachine gun armed groups, confining the Soviets ever more to the road and besieging Suo Mulselmi. 
As frostbite and starvation take their toll on the Red Army, Finnish forces identify weak points in their defences, launching swift attacks to cut the overstretched Soviet perimeter into smaller pockets known as moti, a term for firewood left in the forest by woodsmen to be collected and burned later. The stronger moti are harassed and left to freeze and starve, while the weaker ones are cleared with well-planned infantry attacks. By late December, the 163rd has been utterly routed, forced to retreat north and then east to the Russian border by a force less than one-third its size. With the 163rd defeated, the Finns turn their sights on the 44th. Having failed to relieve Suo Mulsalmi, the 44th now finds itself in an even more dire situation, spread out along many kilometers and completely confined to the Rate Road. In turn, it is surrounded, isolated, and destroyed in detail using the same Moti tactics throughout late December and early January. Altogether, the 6,000-strong Finnish force has devastated two Soviet divisions, totaling nearly 30,000. The 163rd and 44th lose more than 10,000 killed and countless more to frostbite casualties, while abandoning massive quantities of weapons and ammunition to the Finns. The battles of Suo Musalmi and the Rate Road thus served to showcase the deadly effect of successful Finnish doctrine, theatre preparation, training and tactics we covered in our series. But the war was far from over. Meanwhile, the situation for the Red Army tasked with seizing the Finnish port of Petsamo in the far north is little better. While not subjected to the same calamitous defeat as their comrades in the 9th Army, the Soviet forces in the 14th Army attacking along the Arctic front are subjected to blistering minus 40 degree winter conditions, chest deep snow, near constant night and effective Finnish harassment. As news of the disaster to the south filters through, the Soviet command revises its war plans for a renewed offensive on the Karelian Isthmus and adopts a defensive posture along the vast frontier. Maneuver warfare continues throughout January as Finnish forces go on the offensive, targeting vulnerable formations at Kumo and along the shoreline of Lake Ladiga. During this time, the Red Army has prepared a massive buildup of troops, tanks and guns along the Karelian Isthmus, while subjecting the beleaguered Finnish defenders to constant artillery bombardment. In early February, it began its second assault against the Mannerheim Line. The renewed Soviet offensive on the Isthmus, comprising 30 divisions and more than 1 million soldiers, is brutal. Soviet commander Simon Timoshenko plans an attritional offensive, correctly estimating that the Mannerheim Line's defenders are exhausted and will be unable to withstand the tide of men and steel he sets against them. From the beginning of February, Soviet forces launch daily attacks against the line suffering horrendous casualties but rapidly degrading Finnish defences and exhausting their ammunition, particularly for crucially needed artillery. Soon, the Red Army succeeds in breaching the Mannerheim Line in the more open terrain of the Western Isthmus on February 11th, and what follows is a desperate fighting withdrawal by Finnish forces through their secondary and tertiary defensive lines back towards the city of Vipuri. As the Finnish army of the Isthmus nears collapse in early March, a diplomatic settlement to the war is reached between the Soviet and Finnish governments, spurred by the threat of Western intervention. The Winter War ends at 11 a.m. on March 13, 1940, as the Red Army is poised to seize control of Finland's second most important city. The terms of the peace treaty are harsh, Finland is forced to cede 9% of its territory, including the entire Karelian Isthmus. In addition, 400,000 Finns, or roughly 10% of the country's population, are forced to abandon their homes and livelihoods on just 10 days' notice, 
causing widespread hardship. However, thanks to these concessions and the hard-fought victories of the country's armed forces, Finland avoids outright annexation. This outcome proves to be a spectacular success, which stuns the world. None could have ever imagined that such a small, young nation could stand up to the colossus which bore down upon it. The asymmetrical nature of the conflict is deeply informative for students of military history and will be the subject of a more detailed review in another series. At the time, the Winter War provided many lessons for its participants and observers. However, perhaps the most profoundly impacted of all would be the Soviets themselves, who would go on to leverage these lessons learned in blood to adapt their own doctrine for a defensive war against the invading Germans. But this story will have to wait for another time. We hope to explore the war, its origins and its aftermath in greater detail in future videos and hope you have enjoyed this examination of a small but influential chapter in 20th century military history. You can catch script previews, participate in polls and grab HD downloads of all our art by becoming a Patreon or member of the channel. A big thanks to our current supporters for funding the channel and to the researchers, writers and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.